Listen, we're continuing on in a series we started a couple weeks ago called Luke, and it's, ba- it's called Settled Truths for Unsettling Times. And so I'm going to ask you to stand for the reading of the Word today. We're uh, basically addressing the concepts of the Gospel of Luke, not necessarily verse by verse. And so we're making a leap. We've been in uh, first, uh, Luke 1 and Luke 2. We're jumping to chapter 14 because one of the themes that he has is uh, discipleship. And what is that? What does it mean? And so we're going to look at that today. And so uh, beginning in Luke chapter 14, verse 25, let's everybody read together. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to depose the uh, one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. Now, Holy Spirit, we read that your word tells us a lot about this concept of discipleship. And what we read today is a very challenging passage. And so I pray that you can open our minds and our hearts to receive what it is that you intend for this passage of Scripture to speak to us. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. 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 The Lord bless you. Be seated. As we were reading that uh, passage, I would imagine some of you went, wow, that is a very confrontational passage of Scripture. A lot of times we like to go to the Bible and we're looking for peace, we're looking for comfort, we're looking for direction. But how many that know that passage we read today is definitely a scripture, a series of scripture that we would call confrontational. Okay, you're kind of reading that and go, wow, those are like some strong words. And I would say this, you probably haven't heard too many messages based on that passage right there. You might have heard selective ones, but you notice I just said, hey, here's, here's here's this section of scripture And I'm not going to be breaking off from it. What exactly does that mean? And what is it calling us to do? And it has to do with this. It's the concept of discipleship. Discipleship is often considered to be a vague, mysterious concept. I'm pretty confident most of you don't even use that word, discipleship, at your job or where you are. Nobody says to an employee, have you been discipled in the processes of our company? You'll say, have you been trained? Have you been mentored? You'll use a whole variety of language. And so discipleship is one of those words that we put in the category called Christianese. About the only time you ever hear that word is at church. And then if you're new and you don't have a strong spiritual orientation in your background, you might just be looking at other people to kind of like, and I mean, I hear it, but like, what exactly does that mean? What, what, what's the implications of that phrase? And so what I want to show you today is the Gospel of Luke actually paints a picture of discipleship for those unfamiliar with the concept. He's not writing to people who have a bunch of religious background. He's actually writing to a bunch of, if I could use the phrase, newbies, because he's one himself. You see, even though he was alive while Jesus ministered, he did not accept Jesus as his Lord and Savior when Jesus was ministering. He was a product of the Apostle Paul's ministry. 
That's when he heard the gospel. That's when he accepted Christ as his Lord and Savior. So a number of years has passed since Jesus died and rose again and ascended to the Father in heaven. So he's kind of the new guy, and he's learning all these concepts. He's a Gentile himself. He has a background in Judaism, but he doesn't have this massive heritage and so he decides that he's going to introduce these concepts to people. And so in the, actually in his book, he talks about, he gives 20 stories or 20 teachings on discipleship. I just chose one. There was no way I could preach all 20 of them at the same time. So you can see he's saying, I know that this is a mysterious concept. Let me do my best to explain it to you as to what it means. And so... Here's a working definition of what I call discipleship. I'm not going to say it's perfect, but when I have a conversation with somebody and I'll say, have you ever been discipled? Has anybody ever worked with you on developing your faith? They'll say, what, what do you mean by discipleship? Because it is a new concept. They most likely have never even heard that phrase, especially in, in, in a conversation. And so when you say it, you know, how many know everybody's scared to death that they're joining a cult? I mean, that's, you know, it's like, oh, there's a weird word that, you, are you a cult? Are you, you know, are you borderline? Where are you at? You're like, hey, no, 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 I'm not trying to introduce some, some weird language. I'm just, this is a process that we use to help people in our faith. They'll say, well, what do you mean by that? And this is what I say. I'll say, it's a, it's a journey of intentional decisions based on the teachings and character of Christ. In other words, the, we're gonna, we're gonna, God uses the Bible. He uses our relationships of people who are in Christ themselves and he uses the Holy Spirit. It's the idea that as I move forward, I'm not just going to, quote, go with the flow. I'm going to be making intentional decisions to put my life in alignment with what Christ wants me to do and what Christ wants me to be. So it's an intentional thing. But that's going to, listen, how many know that's a lifelong journey? We're always going to need this. And so there are some things about the Gospel of Luke I want to point out because how he tells the story isn't necessarily how we've been trained to hear the story. So he makes a great case. You and I read it. We don't even pick up on some of these things because of how we've been taught and how we've been uh, uh, shown how story, you know, you go to school and they'll say, this is how you write a story to make a point. Well, Luke didn't go to our school. He went to his school in his day. So let me show you a couple things. Number one, he actually starts the gospel out showing how Jesus himself was discipled. Now some of you go, whoa, 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 he's the son of God. You know, like uh, he doesn't need to be discipled. I mean, he's like God. Well, how many know it says that he was not only divine, but he was fully human? So just in order to qualify as our sacrifice, Jesus had to develop his life just the same way that he expects you and I to develop our life. So what I want to show you is, is how Luke showed us how Jesus got discipled. So here's a couple of, we're actually going to back up to last week's message. Why am I doing that? You may not know, well, you probably do. I usually have more things to share than I have time. Wow, some of you already know that, right? <laughs> There was a little laughter on that, yeah. So I, you know, even as I'm preaching, sometimes I'm having to filter things out rather rapidly just for the sake of trying to be respectful of the time. And this is one of those elements that I didn't do it on the fly last week. Like I had it, I just had to say, hey, I can't go there because I'm going to bring it up later. So I avoided a little bit of some things, uh, avoided a few things last week. So here it is. It starts in Luke chapter 2, verse 42, and then goes on to 46 and 47. It says, when he was 12 years old, meaning Jesus, they went up to the festival according to the custom. After three days, they found him in the temple court, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. He's actually showing a process they were familiar with, a process that you and I are not familiar with. Starting at age 12, there were a series of things that a young boy who was becoming a young man would be, uh, would be trained in and I'm just going to say tested in, uh, inquiries made from being able to read a section of the Torah uh, in Hebrew and give uh, some explanations and things. But by the time a young man was 15, he would be put in front of the spiritual authorities, okay, 
and they would ask him questions, and it was kind of like an oral exam, and he would answer, but he was uh, also allowed to ask questions in return of those who were sitting in front of him. Do you notice it says that Jesus was 12? Jesus was three years ahead of his counterparts. Jesus was smart. He was, that's why it mentions that he's 12. This should, he should have been 15. And notice it says that those who are making the inquiries, that says that they are amazed at his understanding and his answers. So he's not just passing, he's flying, he's passing with flying colors. So when I point this out, Jesus is an exceptional learner. I always like to use the phrase, he's a hungry learner. The, the reason I point this out is because he's from Nazareth. And later on, one of the rebuttals given to Jesus was, can anything good, out of, can anything good come out of Nazareth? It was not an educational hub. In fact, it was a deficient educational hub. And so they're trying to figure out how did such a brilliant individual come through such an inadequate spiritual education training. There's only one thing. Jesus was a great self-learner. He was motivated. And it takes us to the next thing, Luke chapter 3, verse 32. Now Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. So while he is in Nazareth in a deficient spiritual educational environment, he's working by day and studying by night. Can anybody identify with that? Because we read that he was working the carpentry. And so, so we know that Jesus... And, and so one of the things that you could qualify for at the earliest age was 30 for people to call you rabbi teacher. And if you look at the New Testament teachings, they were calling Jesus rabbi and calling him teacher. Why? Because he had excelled. In fact, in Luke chapter 4, it says he went back to his hometown and he grabbed the, the scrolls and he read from the book of Isaiah and said, today this is fulfilled in your presence. So at, he, was, he qualified to be a rabbi slash a teacher at age 30, which again tells you Jesus was an amazing learner. Now, I say all that for this purposes. So even Jesus went through a process of being discipled to be able to do what God had put him on planet Earth to do. And here's the thing. If Jesus needed to be learned, I'm pretty sure you and I do. And, you know, the, the struggle that we all have is this. We need to be hungry learners. That's part of it. And sometimes we're not. And then you got to figure out. I can tell you this. My wife knows how to make me hungry. Just throw garlic in the pot. I walk in. I smell garlic in the house. I'm interested in whatever is in there. Garlic is my tripping point to eating whatever's on the plate. If I don't like it, just throw garlic on it and I'm there. It's a trick. So part of this is this. We have to sometimes say to ourselves, why am I not a hungry learner? Because here, God gave you a brain. That brain is designed to learn, to grow, to develop. So you've got to ask yourself, what's my impediment for me becoming a hungry learner? Because this is a lifelong process. So let's begin to break apart this story because it does have some rather strong teaching. It's not comforting. It's not just instructional. It is confrontational. So we're going to put it in the context so we can understand it better. So. Number one, everybody read this out loud. Discipleship helps us. It reorders our life. And we see this in three arenas by the examples that Luke wrote about. Number one was this. It reorders us from the standpoint of moving us from self-fulfillment to self-sacrifice. It says in verse 27, And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. How many know that's just really black and white? Cannot. And it says you must carry the cross. What is he talking about? So most theologians agree that Luke was likely writing between 60 A.D. and 63 A.D. If you know Roman history, that's when Nero was the emperor. He burnt Rome down and he was blaming the Christians and the massive outbreak and persecution was happening Christians were being thrown into the arenas 
uh, uh, to their death. Some were being put on crosses, and while they were on the crosses, uh, they would wrap them in uh, animal fur that had been coated and waxed and light them on fire. So literally, they were a street lamp all night. Now, I know that's graphic, and you say, well, thank you for such an encouraging message on a Sunday morning. But that's the context. And so the, what people are wrestling with is this. Does God really expect me to, to do that? I mean, all they're asking me to do is just say Caesar's God, Caesar's Lord. If I will just acknowledge that Caesar is God and Caesar's Lord, I get out of here. Does God really expect me to go to the wall over such an insignificant phrase? Why can't I just say it and walk out of here? He says, not only does he expect you to say it, he says, I want you to ask him where the cross is that they plan on putting you on, and I want you to offer to carry it. It's not enough to say that you will not say Caesar is Lord, that Caesar is God. That's not enough. He said, I want you to ask him, where's the cross that you're going to put me on? May I have the privilege of carrying it? Notice no amens. It's not exactly a thrilling thought, is it? But what he was saying was this. This is, this is not about trying to, quote, be all that you can be. This is not about self-fulfillment. This is about moving you from making things all about you to moving you to a position of self-sacrifice. It's moving from what can people do for me, how can people serve me, to that mindset of, how does God want to use me to serve them? It's not about attaining a position, a title, a, a rank, so that I have more people to do my bidding. It's about, God, give me those positions because it enables me to serve more people. I've said it, I don't say this, uh, I've said it before, so I'm not springing something here. Some people say, how do you pray for leaders, whether it be on a national, international, local, uh, various contexts? How, how do you pray for leaders when you see such a shift from one time to another? How do you, I say, I always pray this, God, give us leaders that love people. And I don't care whether that's national, international, local, regional, I'm, I'm just, I don't, I don't pray for a particular political, I, I just say, just give us people. Give us leaders who actually love people because they'll act differently. They'll think differently. They'll do things differently. The thing that I see is this, is they don't see their positions as a, an opportunity to serve people. They see, wow, now I can fulfill my political agenda. No, it's not about a political agenda. It's about serving people. And if you love them, they know it. Wouldn't we? You say, where's he going? Oh, stop fishing. <laughs> I'm just saying, that, and I say that with, with any political person. You can tell, you can talk to a leader, and within about five or ten minutes, you can pick up on whether they're there to serve or whether they're there to impose what they want. You can pick it up real quick. It doesn't take a whole lot of conversation. So I've always said, God, give us leaders who love people and that's what the scripture teaches us moving from self-fulfillment to self-sacrifice everybody say amen even if you disagree <laughs> <laughs> secondly he talks about he wants to change our relational priorities i'm assuming most of you are like i can't wait to see what he's going to say about this one because this is a hard verse it says if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother wife and children brothers and sisters yes even their own life such a person cannot be my disciple notice the word very definitive cannot so you're like what is the bible saying there well first of all we mischaracterize how they mean the word hate the word hate does not mean animosity it means to disregard their desires when it conflicts with God's desires. Let me put it in another context that I know that everyone in this room has said at some point in time in your life. Somebody who is a family or, fa or a family member or a friend made a decision that you were in disagreement of and they began to corner you about it 
And you said this, I hate that they're putting me in this position. Anybody ever say that? I hate that they're putting me in. The, you're not saying I hate them. You're just saying I wish they wouldn't do that because I don't agree with the decision. However, I can see that they're using this to define our relationship. I don't back them. They're going to alter the relationship. They may even cut me off. I'm starting to see that this is more than just a disagreement about a topic. This is a litmus test of where our relationship is going to be in the future. So again, let's go back to the context. What's happening here? Well, as I said, there's a massive persecution that has brought, been broken out, and Christians are being arrested. But many Christians, their families as a whole, have not converted. So one of the typical things in their world, whether it be the Roman world and especially the Jewish world, was this. It was called an intervention. How many know what an intervention is? It's where people who love you get together and they basically put some ultimatums on the table to get you to wake up and to change. And it usually has to do with people who are in uh, addiction situations. So, but this kind of intervention would go like this, and it was, it was a normative process in the Jewish culture, for, uh, but it was adopted by the Romans based on the persecution that had broken out. So here's how, here's how a Jewish family would do this. They would sit down with a person converting to Christ, and they would say, we don't acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God, and you have accepted him. We are telling you to renounce him and to stay in the faith in which you were born and you were raised. And they would say, but I can't because I've accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior. That would be followed up with this. If you do, if you do not renounce, we will begin the process of not only disassociation with you, we will consider you dead. And we will remove everything that says that you are a part of this family. You will be considered a dead person by me, your mother, your brothers, your sisters, your aunts, your uncles, your grand. We, the, the synagogue, you will be dead. You don't want to go there. And the person would say, I'm not turning my back on Christ. They would literally, from that point on, said, we used to have a son, but he died years ago. Now, you got to remember, you're not leaving the community. These people are in your life, and they, they won't even acknowledge that you stand there. They won't acknowledge your presence. They consider you dead. The Roman world was doing the same thing because of the persecution. Because of your conversion to Christ, you are putting everybody in this family in jeopardy. We could be arrested because we know you. We disagree with you. If you don't turn it around, they'll catch you, but they might also suspect that we are supporting your new religion, and we're not. Stop it. Tell them Caesar is God and move on. They say, no, I'm not doing that. And again, that family would do everything they could to completely disassociate from that family member because if that family member was ever arrested, they were at risk of being arrested too. So they needed to create a history that would protect them, that we had warned them and we had nothing to do with them. This is the real world of the Christians then. And so the dilemma was, does God really expect me to even lose my family? Such a person cannot be my disciple. You see, you and I can't process this because of where we live today and the conditions that we're living under. But we just had a group of Christians who just went through that in Afghanistan. Just deny your faith. If only for the sake of just surviving... Do it for your kids. Do it for your wife. Do it for your community. Do it for your village. Spare them. I won't do it. In fact, I won't even go into hiding because I know that they'll torture people trying to figure out where I hide. And so many Christians said, we plan on sitting in the church and we'll just wait on the Taliban to show up. 
so that nobody in the community is tortured trying to find out where we went to hide. You and I go, we just can't process that. But see, when you're in that situation, that scripture jumps off the page at you because you're going, hey, even in this most horrific time of my life, God has verses to speak to my context about what I'm supposed to do. See, it goes back to my definition of what discipleship is. What does his word, what does his Holy Spirit tell me? And so he says, you're supposed to reorder your relational priorities. Most of us in this room will never be pushed to the wall to have to handle something like this this bad. I said most of us. But there are people who have been told, if you don't get out of that religion, we don't want anything to do with you anymore. The family just said, you're not welcome here. Stay away. We don't want you here. We don't want you stand for. Leave. And then he tells us this. He wants to move us from ownership to stewardship. Verse 33, in the same way, those of you who do not give up everything. Does anybody need the Greek translated for you there into more English? Everybody say everything. Everything. Say this, everything means everything. everything. You have, cannot be my disciples. Man, there's a lot of negativity in this verse. Isn't there? It's like you It doesn't say you're on your way out. It just says you cannot. And it's changing that mindset. You don't own anything. If you don't believe me, you'll notice that within 48 hours of death, everything that you own is transferred to people who didn't even work for it. Now that's depressing, isn't it? You work your whole life keeping things away from people who wouldn't handle it the way that you would want it handled, and then 48 hours after you passed, it goes to people who did not work for it, and they spend it in ways that would make you roll over if you could roll. Yeah. And it's this mindset. You don't own anything. You're actually just the steward. And it comes to this. See, as an owner, you'll say, well, I don't want to do that with my resources. I don't want to do that with my stuff. This is where I want my stuff to go. This is where I want my money, my thing. And stewardship says this, God, do you want me to invest the money that you've put under my stewardship? Do you want me to invest it over there for you? God, you've given me X amount of stuff. Is this something that you would want me to spend it on? It's yours. Do you want me to do this with the resources that you've given to me? And listen, it still answers the basic questions of life. It's not, so here's a good example. God, do you want me to put a roof over my my family's head? How many know the answer is probably yes. God, do you want me to, uh, you you want me to help my kids be educated? How many would say definitely yes or they'll never move out? Okay, I'm sorry. (laughs) So it's not like it changed, you know, it's not like changing that would change some of the things that we, but we have a different mindset. The, The reason we do it has a different motive. I do it because I am actually convinced that's what God wants me to do. He wants me to invest in my family. He wants me to develop businesses. He wants me to do these things, okay? So, but... It's the purpose is different because it's not for me to get more stuff. It's for me to do more for him. So he moves us from an ownership mindset to a stewardship, to a mindset. I want to do better because, listen, it allows me to do more. Not I need to do better so I can have more stuff. See, that's, that's the wrong motive. It's just the opposite. Yeah, I I might get more stuff because it enables me to do more for others. And it goes back to the beginning. Why? Because it's not about self-fulfillment. It's about self-sacrifice. God, listen, big big question. Everybody should answer at some point. What do you want want me to do with everything you've given to me? And who do you want me to do it for? All right, number two. I'm telling you, your amens are just deafening this morning. But we're going to get there. So, number two, read it out loud. Discipleship teaches true commitment is based on wisdom, not emotion. The Bible doesn't employ some emotional 
hype to get people to buy in. In fact, Jesus said just the opposite. I want you to process. I want you to think about it. And he says this, discipleship is a voluntary act. Jesus is not about tricking people. He's not trying to, you know, oh, you're going to feel it. He says, no, actually, I, I, I want you to do the homework on what I'm asking you to do. I want you to think this through. He says this, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. So Luke is writing to these uh, new followers of Christ who are Gentiles, so really totally outside the, the sphere of having any type of Christian orientation, and he's saying, hey, I, Jesus actually wants you to think this through. He's not trying to get you on, a, on an emotional hype that you buy in and then later on when the emotion wears off, I wasn't sure of what I said. Jesus is just the opposite. He's actually saying, I think you, you need to process this and think about what you're going through, what you're going to commit. Do you understand the, the lifestyle that you will adopt? Do you understand your motives for what you do severely changes? Think about that, he says. Then he tells us this. That discipleship helps with involuntary dilemmas. Just as that first part of it, that first illustration was showing us that we need to think about what it is that we're doing and why we do it. He says in verse 31, 32, or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he's able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? Notice the surprise. that Here comes an attack. That was couldn't forecast it. But once it hit his radar, what does he do? He processes it. Is this a good idea? He says, if he's not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. So discipleship is not only a conscientious decision that, yeah, I'm in. This is what I'm going to do with my life. And I'm, I'm aware that there's going to be significant motivational changes of why I do things and the way that I do them. But on the other side of this too is I know there's stuff that comes in life and it wasn't on my calendar. It just showed up. Many of you know what I'm talking about. Your calendar is just fine the way it was until you, the doctor told you what was wrong. And you just watched your calendar go, wow. So I have to do this. I'm going to have to do this. I've got to be here. They're telling me recovery is this. Oh, man. And then it usually affects the budget that we have set for our house. You're like, okay, so what are we, how are we going to cover all this? We see it in jobs. Sometimes there's a turn in the business or a turn in the economy, a turn in the, in the market some way. And one week we're, we're great, and the next week we go in and we've been told, hey, there's going to be a scale down, and we've got to let so many people go, and you're one of them. You know, like, I, I didn't see that coming. Some of you know the dread of picking up the phone call, and it wasn't the phone call that you thought it was going to be. And a voice on the other end told you information about a situation that affected you, your family, or something, and you just went, I didn't know when I picked up that phone that that was what I was going to be hearing. There is stuff that happens to us. that It's an involuntary dilemma. It just happens. There we are. And can I tell you, that's when you're, great, that's when you're so glad that you have the, 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 the focus and the values that discipleship helps you to establish because those are anchors that you can hang on to. Those are, those are things that you, you know will get you through the unexpected. The last one is this. Read it out loud. Discipleship is an ongoing process that prevents us from losing our effectiveness. He finishes up this passage of scripture by saying, salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. It's a pretty bad day when the manure pile doesn't even want you. <laughs> now, some of us say, that, that almost sounds offensive. I'm, you know, you, you read that, you're almost like, that's almost, I'm almost offended that a person can reach a point in their walk and God says, you're not even worth throwing on the manure pile. See, some of you want to say, Pastor, I can't believe you said I didn't say it. I read it. Okay. 
So what are you talking about? Well, salt uh, was used for a variety of things. You could, many, many people were actually paid in salt, okay? That was one of the, uh, it, was a, it was a form of currency in its day. So salt could be used to pay somebody. The other thing is salt was used as a preservation. If you don't know this, they didn't have refrigerators back then. So salt was a way of preserving food for a longer term basis. Another thing is salt could be used where there was an infection or a wound. It was a, it was a way of disinfecting the uh, germs and such that might be associated with an injury. But salt, and it could also be used in just standard seasoning of food, okay, to make it taste better. But then the other side of this is too, is sometimes salt would lose its effectiveness. And so when it lost its effectiveness, basically this, they would throw it on a path where they were trying to keep the weeds down so that the path could, could be maintained and walked upon ease, or thrown onto a field, which a lot of military uh, conquest would do. One of the ways that they would penalize the people to make them dependent upon the uh, conquering army was they would put salt on their fields so that they couldn't produce a crop. It would ruin their fields for years. So they would often use the salt that was not effective or being allowed to use another. And notice this. It says, Jesus says, it's neither fit for the soil nor the manure pile. He says, you can't even kill a weed. You can't even, you have lost so much effectiveness, you're not even useful for the most low thing that salt could be used for. You're, you, you're not good for that either. And what the Bible is showing us is this, is we have the ability, if we're not careful, we can lose, we can become a good talker, but nothing to back it up. Hey, John the Baptist was preaching, uh, and he said to the Pharisees, Sadducees, he said, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. He said, it's not that you're not repentant, it's just it never shows up in what you do. And even in the, in the book of James, he wrote, faith without works is what? He said, listen, I hear you, you're saying all the right stuff, but when it comes down to just actually doing it, you don't. There's nothing there, it's just chatter, it's just talk. It never makes a difference. So one of the things that I think it's important for us is to understand is how does God want to use who we are to make a difference in the context where he's placed us? It's different for all of us because God has placed us in different contexts. He's gifted us differently. But I'm telling you, when you get to be salt in culture and you make a change and you made something better, it's a wonderful feeling to walk away from that and go, that's better because I got involved. One of the things that I do here, I teach a class, it's called Network. It's kind of a leadership discovery, and many of you have been through this. And one of the questions that we ask in that, in that, in that session and uh, that we go through is, is this. What is it that you do when you made a difference and you walked away and you were pretty sure God was smiling and grinning? Because he said, thank you. That's why I put you there. Have you ever had one of those days, God, you're piling way too much on my plate right now? Could you slow it down? But can I tell you something? You need to, be, you need to see this. Some of you have said, I, that, I wish I had never made it on my plate. Can I tell you something? God had enough confidence that you would do the right thing, so he gave it to you. He said, this is hard. This is difficult. But I think they have the character. And when push comes to shove, they're going to do the right thing. So I'm giving it to them. Now, I'm going to tell you, there have been days that I've told God I appreciate all the confidence he has in me. But if he could slow down how much he's putting on the plate, I'd really appreciate it. Appreciate the confidence. Just slow it down a little bit. But no. You ought to thank God that he trusts you. That it was messed up. 
It was not working. People were discouraged. People were being taken advantage of. People were in crisis. People, lives were on the line. And he said, I got the person for that. You. And God says, I know in the heat of the battle, I can count on your vows and your commitment and your, your core commitment to do what needs to be done. And I, I'm convinced when we do that and we come through, God's going, now that's my girl. That's my boy. That's why I put him there. Because I knew they'd handle it. Now so you and I go, please God, give me a break. But what I want you to walk away from the day is this. When you handle some hot stuff and some difficult things that nobody wants, and you do what needs to be done, I pray you feel God's grinning. And just saying, well done. I knew I could count on you. That's discipleship. When it's hot, it's tense, it could go either way. And God puts you in a place where you're the one who gets to tip the scale the way it needs to be done. That's what discipleship is for. And I can tell you this, there's never a day that you don't need to stop learning because those hot issues are going to be constantly in all of our futures. I just want to say, when those hot issues come, I know his word, I know his spirit, and I'm going to do the right thing. And everybody said amen. amen. Come on, let's stand to our feet as we wrap up the service today. Would you do that? Would you just lift your hands and praise him? Praise him for being a God who has confidence in you. Praise him. Listen, some of you, you need to look in your past and say, God, I complained when it happened, but I want to praise you that I, you had confidence in me. You had trust in me. I never saw it that way. Some of you said, well, why does this always happen to me, God? Because he, he has confidence in you. He trusts you. Turn it around and make that complaint into a praise. Come on, 30 seconds now.